Well, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 39, while I do the same. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, if you have a Christian that works in your workplace, maybe in the cubicle next to you, if you've ever been into a Christian bookstore, if your mom is a Christian, if your mom forwards you the emails of Christian stories, my mom is here today, and I love you, mom, and I love the stories that you send me, and I think my mom has actually sent me this story. If you are around Christian things, then you know of what is probably the most wildly famous poem that's been written in the last 75 years of of Christian themes, and that is the poem, Footprints in the Sands. It's been written by Mary Stevenson. It's the kind of poem you'd have on an inspirational calendar that hangs on the cubicle, or it's the kind of poem that's framed with the words overlying a picture of the ocean and the, and the footprints. This poem, if you're not familiar with it, tells the dream of a person seeing their life as a walk on the sand of the beach. And in some seasons, there are two sets of footprints that walk along the, the sand, and in others, there's just one. The person, upon closer looking at the sets of prints, discovers that the one set of prints disappear at the most difficult times, at the lowest of of moments, at the lowest of lows, it, it seems to vanish. And praying to God, the person asks this, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would always walk with me. But I've noticed that during the most trying parts of my life, there has only been one set of footprints in the sand. Why? Why, when I needed you most, Have you not been there for me? The Lord replied, The times when you have seen only one set of prints, those are the times when I carried you. Why has this little poem, why of all the poems that have been written over the last 75 years, why is this little poem one of the most enduring, recognizable pieces of poetry that has endured. It's because, I think, whether you like the poem or not, it's because you know, and I know, and virtually everyone knows what it feels like to be alone. You know, and I know, and virtually everybody knows what it feels like to be lost, to feel like you've been abandoned, to, be, to feel like you have been forgotten, to feel like you have been forsaken, to wonder where God is when things start going tough for you. We, we, we can see God, we think, when things are going well, right? Good things happen to us, and we say, You've got to hear this thing that God did. This was a God thing. He, I got more money or this, this, this chance encounter happened. It was a God thing. We rarely talk about the God things when it hurts. We wonder, where are you, God? Why have you allowed such pain to come into my life? And how is your sovereignty working for the good of your people? As we are going to God's word through the life of Joseph, as we examine this theme of how God's sovereignty works its way out in the good of his people, we start to see some of the pieces of the puzzle come together. We began this study last week. When we last left Joseph, at the end of chapter 37, you remember if you were here last week, Joseph had received these two dreams, these dreams that, ex- that show that he would be exalted over his brothers, he would be exalted over his parents, that his brothers and his, and his dad would, and his mom would bow down to him and his brothers hated him for it and they planned to kill him and they betrayed him and they eventually threw him into a pit and they left him for dead. Only to, only to rescue him out just a few moments later, can you imagine Joseph getting out of the pit thinking, well, maybe they've changed their minds. Well, yes, they have, but not the way that Joseph, you might think, There was a traveling group of traders that had made their way by, and they sold Joseph into slavery. 
God had appeared to forsake Joseph. God had appeared to kill the dream that Joseph had received. God appears to be absent at the end of chapter 37. Chapter 38. Chapter 38 breaks into the narrative we just started, but the the narrative of Joseph's story is broken by the, the author's intention to tell the story of Judah, who is one of the older brothers. And we saw last week he's the leader of the brothers. It's Judah who the brothers follow, and Judah becomes the future leader of Israel. We're not going to spend our time in chapter 38 today. We're going to be in, in 39. But if you go home and if you read the story of Judah, you'll see it's a, it's a messy story. It's a complicated story. It's a story of Judah's sin. It's a story of his willful disregard for God, for God's plan, for God's promises. It's a willful disregard of what God wants to accomplish. It's a full-on pursuit of what Judah wants to accomplish and wants to, to pursue And yet we see that even through the messiest of sin, God's sovereignty prevails. God's sovereignty prevails, and the line of of Judah is established. You can read the chapter on your own. The reason why I draw your attention to chapter 38, since we're in chapter 39, is obviously context. But also, that of the many things that chapter 38 accomplishes for us as we come into chapter 39, it pulls us, listen, 20 years away from the fateful day in Dothan when the brothers betrayed Joseph. The narrator teases us out 20 years worth of another story before returning back to Joseph's story to understand what happened. And so we're left, as we would be reading through chapter 38, and as the nation of Israel would have read through chapter 38 and wondered, what happened to Joseph? We were talking about Joseph, right? He got sold into slavery. What happened? Is he safe? Is he dead? Is he embittered against God? Is his heart hardened? Is he living a life of of vile and wicked sin? As we move from chapters 37 through 38 to 39, one author wrote this, Frank Delitz wrote, we get to experience with Joseph the comfortless darkness of two decades during which hopeless and sorrowful longing was gnawing at the heart of the aged father, his dad, Jacob, and the secret curse of deadly sin, deceitfully concealed, was weighing on the souls of his children. Twenty years they bore this guilt over what they had done to their brother. And now in chapter 39, the the tension begins to resolve. Chapter 39 begins to fill in the gap of the 20-year span of what's happening in the life of Joseph. And that's where we are going to pick up the story today. We're just going to read the setting together and then keep your Bibles open. We'll be back working our way through the whole chapter as we go. Verse 1, now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, The captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had." From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we often feel alone. We often feel overwhelmed and confused as to the mysterious working of your sovereignty in our lives. Lord, we confess that we are tempted to judge your goodness based on what our eyes see. God, we ask that you would remind us today of your great love for your people, fulfilled in Christ for the sake of your own glory, and that you would guard us from grumbling, complaining at your loving providence in our lives. 
Spirit of God, move among us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 39, verse 1, begins exactly where chapter 37 left off. Joseph has been brought to Egypt, far away from the promise of God, far away from the promise of the land. His dreams have been shattered. The Lord has laid Joseph low. This dream of him being exalted has ended up in humiliation. Joseph is a common slave. He is a common slave, but not to a common master. The the narrator, look at verse 1, goes to incredible lengths to describe who has possession of Joseph. It's Potiphar. He says, an officer of Pharaoh, who is the ruler of the nation of Egypt. So this this Potiphar is an important man to an important man. He is the captain of the guard, it says, which means he has great power and, and influence and authority within the military. And then there is the punctuation of the obvious. He writes, Potiphar was an Egyptian. As Israel would later reflect upon this story, they would be reminded of their own enslavement to the Egyptian masters, the pain that they suffered together as a people, where the Pharaoh had, had built his city on the backs of the Hebrews, using them as slave labor, building grand buildings and, and breaking their backs so that the glory of Pharaoh could be lifted up. They would have been reminded of, of the order that was given by Pharaoh to throw all of their baby boys into the Nile River to drown. God oftentimes to Israel, like he does sometimes for us, seems distant and absent and far away. And yet verse 2 says, the Lord was with Joseph. Four times in this narrative, we read that the Lord was with Joseph. Though his life had taken a turn that no one could have expected, the Lord was with Joseph. Though he was abandoned and betrayed by his own family, the Lord was with Joseph. Though he was in a foreign land, all alone, a common slave, the Lord was with Joseph. This text is pointing us from the outset that Yahweh has not abandoned his servant. The Lord was with Joseph, verse 2. And as a result of the Lord being with Joseph, he became a successful man. And he was in the house of the Egyptian master, verse 3. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Now pause, pause the story. There's always this turning point in our lives where we stop kicking against God. We stop resisting God's sovereignty in our lives. We stop, we stop resisting his will. There's always this point in our lives where we, we stop resisting and stop getting angry and stop crying about the way that the Lord has dealt with us. And he moves us to a point where we accept his sovereignty and we begin to embrace his sovereignty And when we embrace his sovereignty is when we receive the joy of knowing God and his promises for his people that extend out into a future that we never thought was possible. Joseph has done that. This verse doesn't describe for us a man who is wallowing in self-pity, a man who is is wallowing in, in, in in the... victimize perspective of the situation. He's not sitting around feeling sorry for himself as as best as we can tell. The description we get of Joseph is somewhere in the beginning stages of this 20 years, he embraced a path not of his own choosing. And the Lord was with him, much like the Lord is with us. Unpause the story and immediately insert providence. It says that he was in the house of the Egyptian master. 
Joseph was not relegated to the status of a field slave, but he was assigned to serve within Potiphar's house. Why? We don't know. God's providence. But he put him around this this man. And as a result of of the Lord being with Joseph, God prospered everything that he set his hands to. The overwhelming attention in this verse is not to Joseph's ability or to his skill. It's to the Lord being with Joseph. That's why he prospered him. So much so that when his master Potiphar saw God's favor on Joseph, even though he didn't know the God that Joseph worshipped, he saw the favor of God upon him. Verse 4, so Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And here's the result. Potiphar made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. So Potiphar may not know the God of Joseph, but he sees a good thing. And he knows a good thing when he sees it. And so he, he puts Joseph, at the highest place that a, that a slave can be, he gives, him, he gives him full authority and responsibility over his entire house. Joseph has become, literally, Potiphar's personal assistant. All of Potiphar's stuff, Joseph's in charge. All of Potiphar's people, Joseph's in charge. All of it's under his care, and the Lord blessed his work. Verse 5, from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord, listen, blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Now, after we left off in Genesis 37, this is shocking. This is incredible. The rise of Joseph to prominence and to prosperity is as incredible as the disaster Joseph faced in Dothan. It's as improbable as what he faced by the hands of his brother, his brothers. Zoom out for just a moment. Zoom out of the story for just a moment and remember what's being taught here in context. Genesis, remember we talked about a little bit last week, Genesis is the prehistory of the nation of Israel. It's the prehistory of how Israel came to be. Joseph is the last of ten stories that connect creation to, through the patriarchs, and to the Egyptians to explain how Israel got to be in Egyptian captivity. Moses is writing this book to the nation of Israel to show them how they got enslaved in Egypt and that through everything from creation, throughout Abram, throughout Isaac, throughout Jacob and Esau, and then through Joseph, all of the story, God's sovereignty triumphs over everything. Flip back to Genesis 12, if you would. Keep your finger here. Flip back to Genesis 12. And we're going to see a promise that was made to Joseph's great-grandfather, Abram. This promise in Genesis 12 casts its shadow over the entire book of Genesis, over Joseph's life, even over the entire Old Testament and through Christ into the New. In Genesis 12.1, here's what's recorded. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We can see that that this promise to Abram, God's promise to Abram, which is ultimately realized in its fullest, grandest way through Jesus Christ for all the nations, this blessing of Abraham is starting to spill over into the nations through Abram's line, his great-grandson, Joseph. The Lord is blessing the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And we get to this point in the story and we say, finally, It's about time, because we know how the good stories go, right? Yeah, there might be some problems in Genesis 37, but we know 
We know that it's not going to last forever. We know that, that finally God's going to rectify the situation and, and make it right. Don't we think that way about our lives? We think there's this threshold of, of suffering that we're allowed to go through no more than just right here and, and that God is indebted to us in some ways because he allowed us to suffer over here, he's indebted to us to, to make things great in our lives over here. You can look at this passage and think, well, Joseph suffered, and now he's prospering. So if I'm suffering, God's going to prosper me and give me all this land and give me all this money and give me all this power. That is a dangerous theology. That is a dangerous theology because it makes... God, a slave to your expectations. The Lord may indeed visit you with prosperity, but the Lord is no slave to you. As promising as this story starts to appear for Joseph, the roller coaster takes a serious dip in verse 6. Here's where the conflict begins. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Well, this is foreboding. Joseph has been exalted to the place of highest prominence that a slave can have. And if there is anything that's going to derail Joseph from the favor of God and from the favor of Potiphar, it's this. Now, she is not just any woman. She is the master's wife, which means that she would have had indirect authority over all of the slaves. So this is, this is more serious than just someone else doing this. This is this is, in some respects, an indirect command from Joseph's boss. And, and, and make no mistake, this was no subtle innuendo. This was a command. This was a command. This was a command from his master's wife to do the unthinkable and to lie with her as a husband ought to lie with a wife. It wasn't unusual in this day for slave owners to use their slaves for enjoyment. And that's what she's attempting to do. And so Joseph is stuck. Joseph is stuck. If he gives in to her command, he sins and loses favor with God. If he doesn't give in to her command, he disobeys his master's authority through his wife and he may lose his job. So he's stuck between sin and success. What would you choose if you were there? Here's what Joseph did. He refused. He refused. He said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house he is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself because you are his wife. How then, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Verse 10, and as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. So Joseph refuses, and he gives three reasons for why he refuses. The first is Potiphar's peace. Isn't it amazing that the first thing out of Joseph's mouth is concern for Potiphar? By putting Joseph in the job that he has, Potiphar doesn't have to think about any of his home affairs. Potiphar can accomplish the job that the Pharaoh has set for him. So to, to do this would to violate the peace within the home. So Joseph is a loyal worker. He's thinking about Potiphar's good. Verse 8. Second, verse 9, Potiphar's trust. Potiphar's trust. 
He has lavish favor on Joseph in every possible way, not withholding anything from Joseph's care except for giving Joseph his wife. It's one limitation. That's it. So to do the one thing, the one thing that he's forbidden to do would violate completely and betray the great confidence that has been given to him by Potiphar. Third and most important, God. Verse 9. Joseph sees this scene as a moment of temptation that involves him and God. All sin, including and especially sexual sin, is sin against God. It may be playing itself out on the horizontal stage, but it is a vertical problem. It is a vertical sin and transgression against the authority and the holiness and the sovereignty of God, the God who was with Joseph. So in chapter 38, where Judah, when you go home and read it, if you haven't yet, when Judah distorts the gift of and design of sex for his own sinful ends, Joseph sees this as an abomination to God, and he refuses. Now look very carefully in verse 10. Verse 10 says that this scene played itself out over and over again. Can you imagine? Day after day after day after day after day, she is trying to wear him out. Eventually, he will give in. She says to him, day after day, lie with me. Commit this sin. The main point of this narrative is not be like Joseph, avoid sexual sin. The title of this message is not purity, Potiphar's house to your house. That's, that's not the main point of this passage. As we continue to, to see, and you've already heard echoes of, there is a bigger, greater truth that Moses wants, the nation of Israel and God, by putting it in the Bible, wants Grace Church today to get, to understand, and to believe with our whole hearts. There is a greater truth than that here, but that doesn't mean that there is no lesson for us to gain and glean from here about sexual temptation. There is There is a lesson here for us, and it is not, first and foremost, say no to temptation. We must say no to temptation. But here's what the lesson is, I think. After all these years... After all that Joseph went through, after all the sin that he endured upon his shoulders, after being totally betrayed by his brothers, assaulted, thrown into a pit, left to rot in Egypt as a slave, you would expect to find a man whose heart was bitter towards God, a man whose heart was forsaking God. Who needs you, God? You didn't save me when I needed you. Why am I going to turn to you now? A man who is unwilling to trust God. But Joseph loves God. Joseph's heart is sensitive to God. Joseph, listen, he's not, he's a victim who's not living like a victim. He's not living as one who has been sinned against. He's a man after God's own heart. That's what keeps him from sexual sin. He doesn't have covenant eyes or canine protection or or web filters. He has a heart after God's glory. He loves God despite how bad the circumstances have fallen for him, and he doesn't use his disappointments with God as justification for future sin. No, he doesn't. When Joseph thinks about sleeping with another man's wife, he doesn't think, this will show you, God, who's in charge. He doesn't think, 
I deserve this after all that I've been through. He doesn't think, wow, my lucky day. I'm going to find true love. Joseph's response is, how can I commit such a great and wicked sin against God? Oh, that we would have hearts like Joseph in this way. Oh, that we would have hearts that are, that are captivated by the glory of God, God's love for us as his people, God's holy hatred against sin, which we see when we look at the cross, God crushing his son to rid us of sin's power and to forgive us of its penalty. Oh, that we would have hearts that are so captivated by God that as temptation speaks to us, day after day, day after day saying, look at me, click here, do this, you need this, you deserve this, church, that we would respond as Joseph responds and that we would not even give it a listen, that we would not even entertain the thought against our God. This might be a wake-up call for some of you. This might be This might be the voice of God speaking to some of you in this room. You might be thinking or have been thinking, what I do in this area isn't hurting anyone. It's not harming anyone. Nobody knows about it. And so it's not that big a deal. It is a great and wicked sin against God that God died for to free you from. So church, all of us, let us be chastened by Joseph's example In a compromising situation, day after day, he is faithful to God. Now here, the story seems to resolve. Joseph has resisted. But verse 11, one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, finally, she gets him. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Sometimes fleeing is the best option. Joseph runs. He literally, she's grabbing his garment and literally pulls it off, and he runs probably in full sight of a lot of other workers. As one commentator wrote, Joseph's flight not only enrages, but also compromises his mistress. There's no hiding this. He may well report her for sexual assault. But the shrewd wife of Potiphar gets to it first, verse 13. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. This is, this is idiom for to have sexual intimacy with. You can cross-reference it with Genesis 26, 8 and see the same usage. She says, he came in to me to lie with me. That's a lie. And I cried out with a loud voice, lie. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, lie, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house, lie. All lies. Then she laid up his garment by her until her master, his master came home. So earlier, his robe was false evidence for his death. Now his garment is false evidence for his crime. She has the crime scene ready. She she has the garment laid out on the bed next to him so that when Potiphar comes home from work, he not only hears the report, he not only has the, the image in his mind through her report, but he can visually get a picture of the scene. He walks in the door, verse 17, and she told him, Read with me the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. So she has effectively framed Joseph in the worst possible light. He's no longer even being described here as just a Hebrew. Now he's a Hebrew slave. A slave that's betrayed his master, a slave that's attempted to rape his wife. This could not be worse for Joseph. Humiliation, 
exaltation, humiliation. Isn't that the story of God's people? As soon, verse 19, as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. Well, no, duh. He was angry. He was out of his mind. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. What? Your justice meter should be like going off the charts as you read this story. What? That wasn't the way this was supposed to go, right? He already suffered. God had prospered him. There should have been no looking back. Totally unjust on every step. Well, it says that the Lord was with you, Joseph, when you were in Potiphar's house and all sorts of great things were happening. Where were you when, when you were being falsely accused? Where were you when you were being slandered? Where were you when you were being charged with rape? Where were you when you were being convicted? And where were you when, when you were being thrown in the prison, Joseph? Where was God? Well, look in verse 21. It tells us at the heels of this statement. He was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. Where was he? He was right there. He never left. He was never gone. He was never absent. He had never abandoned him. Just because we suffer even great injustice at the hands of men does not mean that God has forsaken us. It doesn't. The Lord was with Joseph in his rise, and the Lord was with Joseph in his fall. In fact, the text says, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. This word is the word that's used for God's covenant love, his hesed love, his steadfast, immovable, never-changing, never-breaking love. In the prison, the Lord showed his love to Joseph. Isn't that where we need it most of all? Isn't that what we need most of all when we suffer? To know that the Lord is with us. To know that the Lord has not abandoned us. To know that when life turns bitter, God's love is always sweet. I've said this before, I'm going to say it again today. Faith is not believing that everything will happen the way you want it to happen. Faith is not believing that everything will happen the way you want it to happen. That's magic. That's not faith. Faith is believing that regardless of what happens, regardless of whether God prospers your plans or whether God turns your plans upside down, on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross and resurrected, on the basis of his great atoning work, regardless of whether you prosper or whether you suffer, God is with you. Faith believes that God is with you in the prosperity and in the suffering. That's biblical faith. That's not a dangerous theology. That's a God-glorifying theology. That doesn't put God as a, as a slave to your expectations. It doesn't make him a vending machine for you to push the buttons. But a God that we can know and trust because of what he has accomplished for us in Christ. So let us be chastened by Joseph's example, but that's not what this narrative is about. This is about teaching Israel and teaching the church now that the Lord is with his people always. And God's sovereignty is always working good for his people in the prosperity, in the suffering, always working good. How? We can't always see it. We're, we're too close at times. We must zoom it out to the, to the fullest picture to see it. But the Lord was with Joseph in Potiphar's house, and the Lord was with Joseph in Potiphar's prison. And his steadfast love never waned. His love was with the people of God in their prosperity as he led them out 
of Egypt in the Exodus, and he was with them as a people wandering in the wilderness. He gave a a cloud by day and a fire by night to assure his people of his presence. He was with Israel when they prospered under King David's reign and, and with Solomon when his glory came and filled the temple. And he was also with Israel when they were exiled out of the land and the prophetic voice stopped and all seemed silent. He never left. He never left. He was always and always will be the, the shepherd of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake, prosperity, adversity. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, O great shepherd. As Christians, how much more can we be assured that the Lord is with us than even the psalmist who wrote Psalm 23? Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us, the Word made flesh to dwell among us, to bring us into fellowship with God through atonement for our sins on the cross. He's poured out his very spirit into our lives, into our souls to cheer us on and to guide us. He promises us in Matthew 28, 20 that he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. Hebrews 13, 5 says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, The same covenant God of Joseph is the covenant God of us. The one who was with Joseph is the one who is with us today. So where are you on this spectrum? Where where have the boundary lines fallen for you? Are you in a season of prosperity? Are you on the rise? Is your business booming? Is everyone in your house healthy? Is your family life thriving? Do you look around and say, the Lord is is giving me favor over all of my hands? Then do not boast in your wisdom or in your skill or in your spirituality. It's not about you. Boast in the Lord who gives favor. Drop to your knees if you're in a season like that in humble gratitude that like Joseph, the Lord has been with you and is choosing for his good purposes and for the glory of his name in this season to prosper you. Choose gratitude in those moments. Are you in the midst of trial? All of us are on the spectrum from one place to another. Health failing. Job security is shaky at best. The paycheck going shorter and shorter each month? Is your marriage a wreck? Do you look at what your life's about? You think, how did I take another wrong turn? Are you at the place where you're tempted to say, enough, God, I've 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 met the threshold of suffering, no more. Remember that the Lord is with you, even when you can't discern it. He has not abandoned you. And like Joseph in the prison, he's with you to work out his glory in your life through the suffering you're facing. Listen, as we close, the great work of the Christian life is not to do more, it's to believe more. It's not to do more, it's to believe more what God has done. And he'll use us as he sovereignly, providentially determines. Both in prosperity and in adversity. Joseph's story concludes like this in chapter 39. As he moves into the obscurity of Egyptian prison life, having sunk once again down to the lowly places that he may lay hold of God once again, look at what it says in verse 22. 
And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Lord, would you help us to trust you right now? Lord, every person here has their own story of exaltation and humiliation. Where we're tempted to ignore you and take credit for the success of our lives and where we're tempted to think you're not real and you're not around. Lord, would you help us to treasure you as we ought? Lord, would you help us to remember that your cross assures us that you are with us always to the end of the age and beyond, that the great hope of us as Christians is not that we become more sanctified, but Lord, that we will be with you on the final day, having been once for all rid of our sins to enjoy you forever. Lord, would you minister to us? Lord, would you help us to apply this by helping us to to not grumble against you? and to reserve judgment on the circumstances of our lives until we can see it from your view. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.